welcome to the latest in our lockdown series of go live sessions yeah and welcome to you guys um i hope you can hear us clearly and the uh, the internet holds up on this because uh we've had problems at home so we've actually moved back into the club to to get this going um the first um thing i'd like to say to you is that the the one thing that will probably come through hopefully will come through uh, in this in this session is is perspective because i think it's important that we do have perspective on everything that we do at this club because the club's been behind me is hannah mcgall or hannah mcgall on that side who uh was one of the founder members of the club and uh you know that is the perspective that you should keep. it's been a very tough year for everybody and i hope all the people all the swa um we've all been touched to some extent by the by the by the pandemic uh, and I hope that you, you and your families have, have largely come through it unscathed and, and not too damaged by it all. Um, I have to say, and I'm quite pleased to say it, that um, way back last summer when a lot of the clubs in the so-called football family had decided to uh, shut their doors and hibernate and survive, the decision that we took in March of last year was not to do that, was to actively manage the COVID situation and hope to therefore thrive rather than survive. And I'm pleased to say that, you know, my perception is that's what we've done, uh, both on the pitch and off the pitch. Uh, and the reason that that's happened is uh, not because we're any wizards at all, but because uh, people basically stuck together throughout and contributed. A lot of people, and that ranges from the staff in the club who've had a hard time uh, managing through uh, furlough, as a, probably a lot of you guys have experienced as well. They've managed to do flexi furlough through reduced hours, uh, and we of course made those unfortunate redundancies at the time of our demotion um, out of the league, out of League One. So it, it's it's a, it's a thank you to all the staff and thank you to all you fans who contributed by taking season tickets for season 2021. Uh, for those of you who. And felt they could afford to um, leave the the balance of their season ticket monies that were not um, um, basically uh, where we didn't provide service and you couldn't watch games and to leave that in the club that that's very much appreciated by uh, everybody here and for the volunteers who did the stuff that they did both helping out on the community work but also working out on the ground as well and you know to the guys who I constantly bump into who are um, dealing with the pigeon detritus, uh, I have to say a, a big thanks to you guys because that's a, you know to do that for over the course of what must need be nearly a year is uh, really quite a fantastic effort uh, on your part. Um, so a lot of hard work, uh, and the final element to making sure that we um, came through it and didn't just survive, we thrived. Uh, and I'll go on to say why that is, or we will go on to say why that is during the course of, of the next hour. Uh, partly that is because we had a plan you know, and we worked out in the first week of COVID, we, we planned all the various scenarios and what we would do in those scenarios. And so when it came up, we didn't delay, we got on with things and we dealt with things. And so I say perspective is important um, as we deal with the stuff. Uh, um, what I would say is that um, at the time, a few weeks ago, I said to people when they were talking to me, yeah, it, it's right that people are concerned about what happens in the next five games. And, and, and that was clearly one of the, uh, you know, the major features of, of what I call anti-social media. Uh, and, uh, and, and yeah, people should focus on the next five games because it is important to us the next five games, but they have to understand that, you know, I and, and Nicky, we're looking at the next 2,500 games, you know, where this club is in the next 50 years. And so perspective is the key word this evening. Uh, and I apologize if I use it too many times, but that's what this is about. Um, in terms of uh, a season a season review, I'll just say a few words on that. Um, we've got two matches to go and, and everything to play for. Um, fundamentally, we've just got to win the next two games and anything could happen. You know, as a player, I know what it's like to go into the last game of the season uh, at times. And, and sometimes we have nothing to play for and, and therefore we played with, you know, abandon. And we, we, we used to call ourselves the party wreckers and we, we wrecked sort of... Um, either promotion or relegation hopes because we have nothing to play for. Equally, if you were playing with something to play for, then at the end of the day, um, it was it was, it was was difficult because the pressure's on you, etc. So I, I actually think that um, if you stand back and, and, and look, we've had a good, we've had a relatively good season. I think that 
um, when we parted company with, with Michael Jackson, unfortunately, you know, we only had nine points from 10 games. But since that time, um, you know, with, the, with the impact of, um, uh, of the two guys, Dorsey and Parkey, and with the uh, advent of, of um, um, the manager, we've actually moved to a season whereby, you know, if you look at it, we've got, um, we've got to the third round of the cup again. We got to um, a cup final and we went to Wembley again, obviously for the fourth time in less than four years. Uh, and at this point in time, with two games left to play, where we can feasibly um, make the automatics. It's likely we'll be in the playoffs. Uh, and again, you know, hopefully um, if we're in the playoffs, then we have another trip to Wembley coming up. So at the end of the day, I think that, um, you know, that has been something that um, we by and large uh, can say has been a relatively successful um, season on, on the field. I think in terms of financial update, uh, what I would say is we've thrived. We, we will be fine. We made a small loss at the end of 2020, in June 20. We've just filed those accounts. Um, but you'll see from the accounts that we actually have net assets of, 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 of far more than ever. We've had the ground revalued and properly revalued. And that's important. Um, we've also got the impact of the investment by Santini in there. And so if you're starting to talk to people about what I call the covenant of the club, the ability of the club to stand and be a proper counterparty to get involved in deals, we look a lot more substantial than a lot of the clubs around us. Um, in terms of the uh, this year, we, we will we'll be fine. There are many uncertainties still going forward next year. We still don't know about gates and so forth and so on. Um, but we shall be able to manage all of that. And there are some questions later on on detail on that, which, which I can deal with. Um, but the other thing was at the start of, uh, of COVID, when I, I first did the plans and looked at the, 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 the situation going forwards, um, I knew that we had uh, stored in, in, in the club and in the balance sheet uh, sufficient reserves to deal with um, not only the pitch collapse, which happened just prior to COVID, uh, but also to deal with the projects that we were um, looking to deal with. And Nicky will talk a little bit about projects in a second. Um, and we were going to, we were safe because I knew we could use those funds. Absent a rescue fund, if nothing else happened, we could meet all of our contractual liabilities uh, and use those monies to deal with that. Fortunately, um, as we've managed the situation and things have come through and, and happened, uh, we've actually not only sort of gone through um, COVID, but we will we, we will be fine this season uh, profitability wise, um, but we will also be able to do all of the projects. So we will do the, the projects that Nikki will talk about now, using the funds that were there and stored up for these projects, which at the end of the day, will continue to contribute to that which we've got available to use as a playing budget. I think Nikki, you want to just talk about some of the projects? Yeah, I mean, there, there's been, I guess, apart from the, the first team pitch, which we've spoken about before um, on these sessions, so I won't bore you all with again tonight, um, other than to say, although it, it might have looked a little bit um, lean on grass for a short period during the winter, if you look at it now, it's fantastic. And, uh, you know, you can see the benefit of having that hybrid uh, pitch really coming through now. Um, the big projects that we've been working on, um, one which I think will make a big difference to us is Beechwood Recreation Centre, um, which we're having an open day for the 15th, on the 15th of May for anybody who's interested to come down and have a look. And that's ahead of the formal uh, opening for business on the 17th of May when um, the lockdown restrictions lift. Beechwood is... Um, an estate which obviously is right at the heart of Wirral, but we where we felt that the club was underrepresented. Um, we've done a lot of work with them during lockdown to try and help the situation that they're in. And I'm really pleased that we're taking over now the recreation centre there, which was previously a sort of failing council um, run site. We've put a state of the art uh, brand new gym in there uh, with £70,000 worth of, of, of new gym equipment. Um, it's got a fantastic sports hall. It's got other um, sports areas. It'll also enable us to work with the residents of the Beechwood Estate in terms of educational provision. Um, we've got classrooms there, so we will be introducing 
a new fitness related qualification um, that is much in demand and, and little in supply in terms of Wirral. And also we're looking at doing some alternative provision there. So these are for um, kids who've been excluded from school. Um, we've been doing alternative provision from uh, Tramir for a couple of years now with quite a bit of success. So I'm really excited about being able to extend that into Beechwood. So that's the first of the projects. The second one is the rec centre. Um, at the moment, the rec centre doesn't have any changing room or showering. Well, it has a, a minimal amount. I think it has one, one shower in the ladies' toilets. I'm not sure if it has one in the gents. I haven't been in there. But we're going to have proper, proper changing rooms built, proper referee facilities, proper locker facilities, so that it will be a venue that um, you know businesses can come and use and train at lunch times, knowing that they can get showered and go back to work. It will be something where we'll be able to host tournaments, more competitive games with with proper decent facilities. It will also link into the Legends Lounge. We'll be building a bridge between the two buildings and a, and a sort of combined reception area and uh, upgrading the toilets in the Legends as part of that, which I'm sure um, any of you in Trosk who use the Legends lounges on a match day will know is a much overdue project. So that should hopefully significantly improve things on a match day. Um, another big project which we've been talking about for a couple of years but is finally underway and they uh, broke ground a couple of weeks ago is the 3G pitch at the campus. Um, this is a really important one for us because it's an important revenue stream for the club in the future. It's an important community asset for LISO, uh, which is an area which is desperately short of, of good football um, pitch provision. But also it will enable us to expand our college provision um, because we are the success of our college means that we're out of pitch space. There's obviously only so much you can play on grass pitches without wrecking them. Um, and so we're sort of victims of our own success that we needed more pitch space and the 3G will certainly provide us with that. So work started on that a couple of weeks ago and that will be up and running and in commission in time for the September. Season. Yeah, the new season. Um, and then finally, a smaller but important project is we are putting a passenger lift into the main stand. By a passenger lift, I mean a proper... Uh, normal lift that you would see in a in a shop shop or office building um, and that's a significant upgrade from the stair lift that we have at the moment in terms of making this the stadium accessible for um, our disabled supporters we've got um, seating in the main stand now um, for wheelchair users they can access the lounges but this will just make it so much easier the stair lift that we had was a big step up from previously where we had nothing but the reality is it's slow um, and it's a bit unreliable it's a bit it, it well, I, I had to I had to end up carrying down with one of the supporters <laughs> carrying somebody down in his wheelchair and he, he wasn't a small bloke either so it was a, it was an interesting end to the evening so so the, the the lift I think will be a big step forward in terms of um, accessibility and again that one should be finished hopefully if all goes according to plan by the end of June so it will be ready for the pre-season games um, on the charitable side during lockdown, um, we've spoken at length about this before, so I'm not going to go into great detail here. Um, suffice to say that we are still doing um, the food parcels. I'd like to give a big shout out to Ben um, here in particular who and, and Jess, um, who shouldered a big burden of doing these literally week in, week out for well over a year now. I don't think anybody would have guessed when we um, said we would step in and do food parcels for people who were really struggling at the beginning of lockdown that 15 months later we would still be um, doing it. But they're still turning out, I think it's around about 100 food parcels a week. So um, they are supported by a significant team of volunteers. I have to say the core of which, again, have done the whole period. So um, that is no mean feat and, and thank you to them. There's a lot of, uh, we're finally, as lockdown unwinds, able to restart some of our community activities in person rather than online, which is brilliant. Um, as I said, Beechwood gives us a whole new opportunity to reach um, 
a new area of the Wirral. And there's some other new um, schemes that we are working on that I will tell you more about in due course, like a, um, a, a first, re re first responders scheme that I'm quite keen on. But that's enough on the charitable side. Can I just say before we, we, we finish on the charitable side that one of the big things that uh, the, the charitable stuff and the community stuff we do, it's not just for PR purposes. It's actually very, very uh, um, important in the terms of the strategy of the club. Partly it's to make the, the fans uh, proud of their club in terms of what it does. Uh, but importantly, it, it, also, and it also helps to produce uses of assets that we wouldn't otherwise use. But importantly, it develops the relationship with Royal Borough Council. And you will see through a theme of what we do here is this relationship with Royal Borough Council, which has developed in a way that was a partnership challenge just before COVID. And it's developed in a way that is much more deep than just putting the name on our shirts. So you will see that the, the refurbishment of the recreation centre is in conjunction with funds provided and grant provided by the council. The, the, the Beechwood facility, again, comes from a relationship with the council whereby they are procuring us to develop, to, to develop and deliver services to the community. And the future projects that we've got all relate to dealing with the context within which we live, which is the Wirral. And that is the council. They help us to deliver stuff and we deliver stuff in the community. So it is a very important aspect of the strategy of the club. So that's enough of the homily from us. Um, I'm going to turn now to the questions. Just, this... be, just before we do that, can I just I just whiz off some of the stuff that's come out there. Jörg from Vienna, I won't get you all. Thank, uh, welcome tonight and good George, to see you on. George from Vienna. And Michael <laughs> Coburn in Switzerland, thank you as well. Uh, Liam Ka Carr, Cam, I can't read my own writing. Um, team words and motivation, what would you say? Do you know what? When you get to this stage of the season and you've got the opportunity that you've got sitting in that dressing room on Saturday, I know you wouldn't need to tell me anything. And if you need words of motivation, then you shouldn't be in that dressing room. You've got two games to play, win on both, and potentially you could be up automatically. If not, you're in the playoffs and you've got a potential to go and play at Bromley. Um, Luke Green, thank you. Um, John, oh, I can't remember, Royden, good evening to you. Um, Kelvin Davis, tequila, that's all you said. Uh, <laughs> that's all you need to say. Uh, and Joanne, Vic Duggan, despite the fact people say you're always on break, uh, thank you for using your break and tuning in. <laughs> right, I'm going to go straight into the questions that we've had sent in now, and I'm going to go straight in with probably the most controversial one. Um, are you satisfied with the manager-fan relationship, and how important is this when chasing success? Um, I mean, you clearly always want the manager-fan relationship to be fantastic, and uh, Mickey achieved that, but it's important to note that and probably about three times during the course of Mickey's tenure here, uh, if I listened to anti-social media, then I would have sacked him. So um, it is about supporting the guy in the job, and it is once again about perspective. And I think the first thing in terms of perspective, I would say, is that this season, and I can speak as a player, has been a, a pretty awful experience in terms of not what's happened to us particularly, but the, the, the conditions within which you had to play. No crowds, which is massive. You guys massively help on a match day as a player. Um, the players themselves getting no break because they're going Saturday, Tuesday in a, in a compacted season. And of course, we had, you know, we had two cup runs. I actually tried to get the, the final move to after the end of the season because I thought it would be a distraction. But, so you've had that. And the players themselves, everybody's been isolating in these COVID bubbles and so forth and so on. And they've presumably got the same problems as a lot of you in terms of, in terms of you know, what's happening with their families and, and employment and stuff like that. So it, it's been a horrible environment. And as a consequence of that, you see massive inconsistency right across the league, which means that that's why it's so close at this point in time. Um, there are a vocal, and I, and I believe it's a minority, who are unhappy with the manager. Um, but just a few facts, again, to put it into context. Um, I'm an accountant, so I believe the facts settle arguments and opinions cause them. Um, at the end of the 10 uh, of, of, uh, games, we had nine points. Uh, Keith's been in charge for 38 matches. He's lost nine, two of which were narrow losses to Sunderland, the championship and championship team Barnsley. His 20 wins have included double over Bolton, which I'm sure you're all pleased about, um, beating League One Oxford and Peterborough, 
uh, and Accrington, uh, all competing for quite well in the chat in in the um, in in League One. Uh, his win percentage here at Tranmere is just under fifty three percent, and points per game, which I hate, is um, <laughs> one point eight two. Uh, and if he'd been in place since the start of the season, that an average would have seen us on 80 points um, on top of the league. Uh, Keith Hill's win percentage was 52.6% here and 1.82 points per game. Uh, and Mickey Mellon, whom we all think did a fantastic job here, uh, me included on this. So against the 52.6%, Mickey Mellon's percentage is 46.2%. And his points per game is 1.61 as opposed to Keats 1.82. Uh, and the last time we got promoted is we scored 60, 73 points in the league. One point more than we've got today, but we've still got two matches to play. And that's happened despite having to make up ground on the poor start of you know, nine points in the first 10 games. So two games from the end of the season. We're not yet out of the automatics, although it seems unlikely. And as I say, we got to the third round of the cup and uh, the league trophy final and achieved that despite losing our key striker because uh, if we lost Norse in that season <laughs> when we went up i don't think we'd have gone up um the covid disruption i mentioned and you know playing behind closed doors all of which is not great in that regard um the second element of of, of what seems to be the problem is uh, the quality of, of, of the football that we're playing, oh, sorry, the, the first half is the quality of the football. I actually don't think, if you saw some of the, the clips before um, this, this, this signing on list, you'd see some great football. And the big sadness to me is the team that we put together in the close season and the, the quality of some of the stuff that they've played. I know that in front of a crowd here at Prenton Park, it'll look you know, 10 times better than actually seeing it on iFollow, which is pretty sterile and, you know, and, and pretty boring. Um, lack of connection with fans, again, I think that stems a little bit from playing behind closed doors. Um, I don't get this Bolton thing uh, because, uh, you know, we had Warwick Rimmer here who was never played for the club, but everybody rates him. He, he was certainly a Bolton man. Uh, you had Frank Worthington, who was a Bolton man. Uh, he, was a, he was a player and manager here. Um, and then you had, in my day, uh, for those of you who are old enough, I had Sid Farrimond, who was teaching me. He was a left-back who played about a million games for Bolton. So, I mean, I don't quite get that. Um, the quality of the football perspective, as I say, is, is it, it's been inconsistent for everybody in, in this league. Um, but I, I think just, just one thing to come in there on that, I think it makes a massive difference having for the first time ever watched matches on iFollow myself because Mark and I haven't been able to go to the away games um, recently. Watching on iFollow is a very sterile alternative to being at Prenton Park. And I think the matches do come across as boring, not actually because the quality of the football is bad, but it's because there's no reaction to anything. There's no, you know, when, when somebody's running down the wing and putting in great crosses, people getting on their feet and the crowd going. Um, to be fair, the camera work is often pretty poor because you tend to have a single fixed camera, so you don't see things from all the same angles. And I think it makes, it, it takes a lot of the excitement away from football. So I think when people are saying, oh, we're playing boring football, I don't, I'm not sure we are playing boring football. Um, and I, I think a good way of looking at it, so you look at the Sunderland final, Almost everybody said that was really good football. We played really well. The difference of the Sunderland final was you had professional camera crews with camera angles from all over the place and you had crowd noise dubbed over the top of it. Now, it was only dubbed, but you get that impression um, because they do it very well um, at Sky of the excitement and the anticipation when you get a build up in play. And without that, it's really flat and it's really hard to to just get the same buzz out of a game that you would if you were in the stadium. And if you could imagine some of those goals that we've scored, and I think Rob put some out earlier this season, in front of a packed cop, um, I would defy anybody to say they were boring. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just looking at some of the messages that are coming through. Um, uh, and uh, so I, I can't read them fast enough, so my eyesight's not that good. But Amanda, Amanda Clark, who's in LA, impressive in LA. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And Trisha, uh, yeah, all that's needed is tequila. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll have a word with you later in terms of um, 
making sure you get on the team bus for the last game of the season. Um, oh, hang on, we just got some guy called Mark. Just can we roll that back? Because he said I was in 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 Layer Road when I scored a, a fantastic goal. So Colchester, we don't need, to go we don't need that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just a bit about the connection. Yeah, the connection with the fans. Um, I, I, you know, as, as a player, I can say just to reiterate what what Nicky's saying. But as a former player, you know, the connection with the fans is immense, uh, and it's clearly something that we 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 did try to work on uh, when we came here. Um, I, I think it's I think it's unfair to judge Keith on the basis of this season uh, in terms of the the difficulties we've talked about. It, it's certainly unhelpful to try and drive a wedge uh, between there and to find things that probably aren't there. Keith's an experienced manager, uh, and uh, that's why he was brought in to balance the, the 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 sort of I can't call it youthful enthusiasm because I'm that young, but but the likes of Dorsey and and Parkey, whose coaching abilities I I, I respect. Um, so I I think you know um, I understand why it's happened. I understand you know the circumstances. And you know, for me, uh, one of the big things, uh, and it was said to me uh, quite early on, that that, that when um, when you watch a game normally with a crowd, you then disappear into the pub or into into one of the lounges or into the tent, and um, you have a pint or two pints, and you, you talk through your frustrations, etc. I think that's not happening now. I think that what we're seeing as a consequence in this season is. People are watching it on iFollow in a pretty sterile environment. And you know, I have to say, I agree with that. It's, it is sterile. Uh, and then they immediately get on, 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 on Twitter or whatever it is uh, and, uh, and, and, and sacrifice perspective on the altar of short-termism, which is Twitter. Uh, and, and so we see that and then it gathers weight and so forth and so on. Um, so I, you know, I can understand it. Um, I think it will be better uh, when we get back to playing behind closed doors, but you know, I understand. I understand where, where that's playing in front of crowds. You mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> playing behind closed doors. Yeah, I haven't eaten today, but I've had a few glasses of wine. As you can probably tell. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think just to, just to wrap that subject up, we didn't want to avoid it because I know we'll get accused by uh, people of avoiding it if 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 we didn't address the issue. When we parted company with Mick Jackson we had fans looking over their shoulder worrying about where we're going to get relegated because we were on relegation form. We had nine points out of 10 games. If anybody had said then, when we appoint a manager, would you accept getting to a final at Wembley, getting to the third round of the FA Cup and two games out from the end of the season, being in with a shout at automatic promotion? I think people would have said yes. And that's just the perspective, I think, that's got to balance... Um, some of the negativity that we've seen. Okay, um, the next question was from Paul Lawrence, which is given that the many of the current playing squad will soon reach the end of their contracts, has the club already begun recruitment for next season? And is this process complicated by not knowing which league we're in? The first thing I can say is that um, I, I do know when, when I used to look at Twitter, I, I'm not doing now, by the way, um, that people were accusing. Uh, us or me of being in, on holiday in France. We were actually in our house in France and uh, we got stuck in France and it was, I say to people, it was probably easier for the British Army to get out of France in 1940 than it was for us this summer. But nevertheless, um, you know, clearly I was working on, on, the, on, on the situation and the people who made those comments may not understand that the internet actually works. Well, they obviously do because they made the comments on it. But um, when you start to look at what was going on in the summer of last year, and this is relevant to why there are so many players who are out of contract this year, is that nobody knew when we were going to start playing. If you sign players on, then you actually had to, you couldn't take them on fair, so you had to take their full wages. So in that massive uncertainty, you had to make a gamble on signing players. At the same time, there was the threat to the likes of certain clubs in this league, which I won't mention, um, of a player um, wage cap. And so they were out signing players, about four or five clubs were out signing players on ridiculous uh, amounts of money, upping the market for the quality players. We wanted quality players who could, to my mind, could control the ball and uh, play, you know, play in difficult situations and, and master the ball. Um, so we wanted quality players. But we had this where people were trying to hoover up the quality players, these four or five clubs. 
and this is going through the summer whilst we were fighting the the the, the uh, demotion we didn't know which league we were going to be in at the start of the summer it was clear we then were going to be in league two um you're trying to sign players and players actually want a two-year contract and you're actually looking at this summer coming and you're saying well actually we don't know whether it's going to be a buyer's market in the summer because the the wage cap's going to be in the impact of COVID is going to really decimate the the, 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 the the finances of a lot of clubs. And therefore, there may be players out of work. You'd be able to get players cheaper. We didn't want to commit because we didn't know where we were. At the same time, we were trying to put COVID clauses in place in players' contracts, which means that if we didn't have playing gates, you know, you'd get a reduction in your wage, etc. And all the time we were balancing that between the fact that we didn't know when we were going to start and so forth and whether there was going to be a rescue fund or not be a rescue. So it was a massively complicated scenario last summer that we were balancing. And I took the decision that what I wanted to do was to sign the quality players that we could. And, you know, players like um, uh, the spine of the team, Scotty, um, Speary, uh, Vaughney, um, all had contracts which allowed them to you know play next year so we had them signed up for next year but the rest of them would put on one-year contracts which is quite a significant negotiating uh, win as it were in the market that we were in coming to this year again we don't know whether we're in league one or league two that's been a constant issue because which is a function of the fact that we were getting into the playoffs year after year because we didn't know what league we were going to be in being in League Two was was we were trying to sign players who we knew could play in League One, and that was the focus of what we were doing. That is still the focus of what we're doing now, irrespective of whether we're in League One or League Two. And we believe we can compete in that league. Part of the ability to compete in that league is the general atmosphere around the club. It's the general sort of they come and see the training ground. I know what it's like you've got to go into that's your job. That's the place of work. You come and look at our training ground. It's a championship training ground. And as a consequence, you know, we are confident that we will be able to do what we did last year and put together a good and competitive squad. Um, we, we are looking at players that can play in League One and uh, we are keeping on top of it. One of the things that fans probably don't realise is that if you're in a team, and I can tell you now, if I'm sitting in that dressing room as an ex-player uh, and uh, as a player, I know that you'll be talking to your teammates and saying, well, they've offered me a contract. Uh, if they offered you one, no, they haven't. So that's the type of dynamic you have in the dressing room that you simply do not want to happen. So we will not be offering players contracts. We, we're talking to players and their agents all the time, as we can do, as we're allowed to do. Um, and, you know, we have our plans and we have our targets for next season. But pushing the button on them isn't going to happen today or tomorrow because it's simply not appropriate when we've got two games to play, two important games to play, and we may, may have another three important games to play, and it would be absolute nonsense to disturb that dressing room by signing players now, or even really taking the, the, the position that, that, that you know that we're, we're saying to people, you've definitely got a, a contract next year. But believe me, you know that's the type of, 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 of art, not a science, that's going on around at this point in time. Okay, moving on to. Um... A few questions now on sort of COVID related stuff. Um, the first one is if we don't get automatic promotion and get to the playoffs, this is from Andrew Herbert. Um, do we know how many fans we could have? Well, at the moment, obviously everything's all subject to change because things change um, all the time at the moment. But as best we know, for the semi finals, um, we will be allowed to have a crowd. We're currently in discussions with our SAG, but we expect to have a capacity of around 4,000 at Prenton Park, which basically means we can get all the season ticket holders um, into the ground, plus potentially a small number um, of others. But, and the big but in this, is um, the EFL have decided you will only be allowed to have a crowd at your ground if on the away leg they're also allowed to have a crowd at their ground which i guess you can understand in terms of um you know sporting fairness now the issue with that is wales um, obviously newport are one of the teams who may well end up in the playoffs 
Um, and Wales currently aren't allowing crowds. So if we ended up playing Newport in a uh, playoff semi, then we wouldn't be allowed to have any crowds because they're not allowed to have any crowds unless it changes in Wales between now and then. Um, so far as the final at Wembley is concerned, almost certainly there would be some crowd allowed there um, this time, unlike um, our last final there. Um, we don't yet know the numbers. Um, it's a moving feast. They've obviously been doing some test events. Thankfully, the test events seem to have gone very well. I think they had 8,000 there for the recent cup game. So one would hope that we would have some um, material allocation. But as soon as we know any more, we will um, let you know. And in the meantime, we have to hope we don't end up in a playoff with Newport. Um, next question is, do we have indications on how um, how likely it is uh, that in 2021-22 that everybody will be able to return to the stadium? This is a question from Sean Lindsay. Um, is there likely to be rapid testing or social distancing in force? As best we know at the moment, we expect that crowds will be allowed back um, in the autumn. Um, we suspect that there will be some form of social distancing in place. Don't yet know what it is. It's such a fluid situation. Obviously, the, the situation in the UK has improved so much um, that hopes are rising that we will be able to have a significant number of fans in. I think worst case scenario that we are assuming at the moment is um, that we'll be around the 4,000 mark. Um, just to bore you with the detail, we had to do lots of very complicated calculations for the SAG based on two metre social distancing and one metre social distancing. We can get just over 4,000 on the one metre basis, which we would hope we would be on, um, but it is a bit in the lap of the gods. The, the good part is if we are in the, that one metre um, category and have 4,000, that means we can get all the season ticket holders in at least, which would be um, a great thing to be able to do. Um, Tracy Lyon has asked whether vaccine passports um, will be required. It's certainly not something we're proposing to require from people. Um, if there are government or EFL re regulations that require it, then we'll do it, but it's not something that we would impose. I think we're quite confident that the measures that we put in place um, here at the ground will keep people safe. I think with the evidence that's coming out around virus transmission in the open air um, and some work we're doing with some partners on some fairly innovative technology that's around killing the virus on high touch areas, etc. We don't think we would need that. Um, we have a question from Adam Barr about would we consider opening up a, a section um, of the ground uh, next season reserving for people who want to keep some social distancing um, we would do as long as that doesn't mean that we are compromising on the number of fans that we can get in so if for example we are allowed 4,000 fans in we probably can do that and make sure that people have got extra space around them if they don't want to be sitting near anybody else um, what we wouldn't want to do is is to to limit um, unnecessarily the number of season ticket holders we can get in. Um, and the last one on the COVID thread is a question from Catherine Mercer um, around somebody who wants to renew their season ticket but doesn't want to wear a mask and saying um, if it's a requirement of attendance, would they um, be able to defer their season ticket or, or have a, a refund? I mean, I think... Uh, we're all learning in, in this current um, environment. We've taken the view that if people aren't able to attend the games, um, they are certainly entitled to a refund. Uh, what we're also going to be introducing um, for the new season uh, for people who are really uncomfortable about coming back is um, a non-attenders season ticket. It's obviously at a much reduced price. The purpose of that is for people who want to come back eventually but aren't confident to come back in perhaps in September that they will be able to hold their seat um, reserved for a, a, a season and to get streaming assuming we're allowed to do streaming and programs etc um, but but not actually be able to attend the games so we are trying to do things to to deal with the fact that there may be some people who aren't confident to get back straight away
Um, we then move on to some questions that have come in around more strategic and financial matters. Um, first just, one... Just, sorry, just before that, uh, Kevin Carr, he said, remind us of your early days uh, at Olympic with Dave Bale. Uh, I won't bore you with that, but um, Dave was a fantastic guy. Uh, he, I, I did found, I did really, um, I was really pleased to be able to get to see him a couple of times when I got back, uh, but he died so, so fairly shortly after that, probably because of... <laughs> seeing me again but uh, he was a fantastic guy who, who ran a fantastic club and uh, you know I, I, I was always grateful he got he got me playing football so um, thanks for that and Peter Fox what's, what's your thoughts on Ferrier leaving the club um, there's been a lot of comments I've just seen going up and down about various players and you know Keith Hill and so forth and so on uh, you will appreciate that I, you know, I don't really make um comments on individual players or, or the manager specifically about employment employment contracts and details thereof and so forth uh, for obvious reasons i'm sure if you or your family were employed by uh, an employer that was talking about what they did and their performance and this and that and the other you wouldn't like it so um, apologies i can't really speak about individuals or, or their contracts some financial or strategic questions. Um, the first one of which I'm going to limit you to, I think, a minute answer, because otherwise we will run out of time, which is from A. Higgins. Where do you want the club to be in five years' time? In the National League. <laughs> Are you going to give us a sensible answer now? I'm limited. <laughs> <laughs> no, the club in five years' time, for me, um, I, I've said this many times, that, that um, we, where we sit, are a... A, we will be a strong League One club at this point in time. To move it on beyond that, uh, for any in any consistent period of tenure in, say, the Championship, we have to do various things. We have to attract more investment, which then creates more commercial income that is not football performance related. And it's not as simple as, as, it, as that sounds. But we have plans uh, that can be affected. That if it's not us, then you know we think other people can do that. So I think the club could be, within five years' time, it could be a self-sustainable championship club. But uh, five years' time is probably um, is probably the earliest that can happen in terms of being a self-sustainable championship club. It may be the achieve champion, the championship status uh, um, earlier than that. But being self-sustainable, I think you know it's going to take a bit of time, a bit of investment, and investments in projects to do that. Um, so a couple of follow-up and another thing, I <laughs> couple of follow-up questions from A Higgins. Which areas of the club have benefited most from the external investment? I mean, broadly, all areas of 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 um, benefited from the investments. I mean, the principle of what we've been trying to do is to strengthen the balance sheet, to get rid of debt, to increase the assets that produce income, and that's the balance sheet things. But also balance that against investing on on making sure that we, we're doing what what we can on the pitch so in the very first year the year we were in uh league one we budgeted for a five hundred thousand pound loss and that was because that five hundred thousand pound loss was extra money put into the first team for mickey uh for his budget uh, and so we actually invested in that short because and the reason for that is because we made the transition from League Two to League One very quickly. So we appreciated that the pace at which that had happened, we needed to catch that up and we were prepared to use the investment and part of the investment for that for that investment in the squad. As it happens, we got demoted. I don't think we would have been relegated as it happened. So um, in, in terms of um, what's benefited from the external investment, well, the very fact that we were capable of doing the pitch and we're still able to do the um the other projects that uh nicola listed earlier on just shows that you know that's where the investment has gone um, i have to say the investment in the club hasn't come out into our pockets in any way and has gone purely into the club uh final question from a higgins will the club have the financial strength to challenge from promotion again next season if we don't get promoted this season yes a very ask a, ask a closed nice, question you'll get question. a closed down we like that that's good with you be quiet <laughs>
If gate numbers are limited next season, at least for the first couple of months, can the club manage financially to go ahead with the projects that have been shelved at the moment? Well, I'm pleased to say... And, and this yeah, is... The answer is yes to that. A very short answer to that, <laughs> what we can do. This is... Whether she's pleased or not, doesn't, well, it doesn't matter. But, but... No, 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 no. But, it, but, but this is an opportunity to say a big thank you to the SWA, because actually those of you who've kept the season ticket money in with the club and also some people who contributed to the Sunderland um, fundraiser, which is doing the lift. We haven't shelved the projects and we are going ahead with them. Um, and we should so... thank the EFL for the rescue package as well, which we knew would come. Um, but in the meantime, what we did basically was say, look, we'll cover everything with the investments in, in, in projects that we won't do. And if we get the, 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 the rescue package, that will free up the cash to do the projects. Simple as that. There's a question from Russell Higgins about, is there anything fans can do to volunteer to help with any of the projects? Um, I'm sure there will be. I mean, the, the volunteers have been fantastic during lockdown and, and we see them here sort of every day when we come down. Um, Christine, who is our supporter liaison lead, um, is uh, pulling together the, the database of all the volunteers and I'm sure there will be um, things that can be done. Absolutely, certainly with the first responder thing that I will tell you more about in the short future. Um, Mark Houghton has asked a question about SR's uh, current financial situation. I think there were some reports in the press a week or two ago about some uh, financial issues they've had and does that impact our sponsorship deal in any way? Um, in my opinion, I'm not completely au okay fait with all of the facts and figures, but I have spoken uh, to SR uh, and you know it's the area I used to work in. So um, my view is yes, they're, they're in control of things. Uh, I understand, you know, the situation that they've got, and uh, who wouldn't? I mean, there's no aviation going on. They provide aviation fuel. There's very little travelling going on, and so they've been suffering from COVID, as a lot of companies have. But it's a good, it's a good business. It's a profitable business. It it will be back in profits, as they say. Uh, so it doesn't know. And, and the one thing I would say is, despite the fact that you know they were damaged by COVID as well. They've been uh, fantastic partners to us. They've been very supportive, and uh, in, in in all that we you know we 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 were doing, you know, they're, they're our sponsors. You know, they paid the sponsorship on time and and, and so forth and so on. And so uh, all I can say about that is, you know, it's been one of those relationships um, that is that's been good, uh, and uh, we're very pleased that you know that there's 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 no damage to to SR. Um, in terms of permanent damage to SR in terms of COVID. I just want to say hello to Idrisu from um, from Ghana, who uh, I've just seen on the chat comment is online tonight. It's good to see you. Hope Hi, you're doing well down there. Um, we've got a question now about Liverpool ladies. Uh, this is from Mark Houghton saying, for some Tramere sporters, it's hard to take having Liverpool ladies playing um, at Prenton Park. Can you help us fans understand how important that relationship is commercially? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important to understand the situation um, in terms of uh, there's a difference between a cash flow deal and a profit deal. Uh, and when I signed the deal with Liverpool three years ago, it was on the basis that that would help the cash flow situation at the time. Um, since that time, you know, we've reevaluated things. Um, we probably will have certainly a relationship with them as regards their training at the campus for the next year. They may or more not be. They may or more may not be uh, at Prenton Park uh, for the future. Um, we are fortunately in a position now where we are not. Uh, as tight for cash as we were three years ago when we were in the National League. Um, we are in a position to evaluate things. Uh, there's been a lot of work. I mean, a lot, there's a lot being said about the pitch and it's been ill-informed to be quite honest, but then why would you know? Um, and it's not really about Liverpool uh, women playing on the pitch. It makes pretty much negligible difference to where we are. Um, I am in the middle of a project, uh, not a project, but, but an analysis being done um, with probably the guys who are the best in the world in terms of supply and lighting uh, to pitchers, you know, and I've spoken to Man United, wash your mouth out, but the, the, the groundsman who is acknowledged as um, having the best pitch in the world um, was talking to me and, and, and telling me as to what his views were 
And the issue comes down to solely this, and for all you budding um, groundsmen out there, it comes down to light and the amount of light that we can get on the pitch. We, we've actually gone through, I'm waiting for the final element of, of the things I've asked them for, but they have calculated the amount of light we get on our postcode being in the northwest, in the northern hemisphere, in the northwest of England. And they've calculated also, they've tailored it to the ground that we have. And so the shadow that we get from the main stand and from the cop stand, and I'm going to bore you to death, but they've got these fantastic algorithms that can tell me how many kilowatt hours it takes to actually get the ground up to either 95, 97% is Man United standard in terms of coverage, 95% is pro probably around the very, very, very top uh, Premier League coverage. Because what we're talking about here is we fix the drainage on the pitch and the coverage is subject to the lighting that you can get on the pitch. Now, at this point in time, to get that level of coverage, we need approximately over 600,000 kilowatt hours, about 80,000 pounds a year, because they've calculated exactly the weeks that we need to put it on from late September right the way through to the end. You, you, you asked the question. Right the way through to the end of I think February. they're probably beginning to wish they hadn't. Yeah, no, but I can tell you now, we're right into it. I'm about to get the, the final outtake from them as to whether Liverpool women play or whether they don't play and what the cost is and what the cost of the lights is. So we can evaluate whether economically it makes sense for us to have Liverpool women play in there. And Liverpool women understand that, that it has to be economic for us. And it may be that the fact that we have Liverpool women playing there and we can get the economics right, that we actually have a pitch that not only has great drainage, so you didn't see any of our, 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 our matches called off, but actually has the coverage that satisfies those people who sit in the stand and see Man United's pitch or watch from the television and see Man United's pitch and see our pitch. Actually, I just, I just recommend you, if you can do, if you can get a uh, a chance to have a look at what our pitch looks like at this point in time. It's not like anything I remember as a player, uh, and I think you'd be quite surprised at the extent of the coverage that we now have. Okay, I need to move us on because we've still got some other big questions to cover. Um, a quick one, when will the new Mill sports kit be released and will Trost get to vote on the away colours for next season? Uh, yes, we will still be looking for fan input into future kits, but in terms of this one, it's actually something that I could do with some feedback from supporters. The plan was, um, the, the kit will actually be ready and available for sale in the UK early in June. Um, the plan had been to do a reveal before it's actually ready to give out so that people can do um, orders, pre-orders. Um, the question is, would you rather have a reveal done in May during the season, towards the end of the season, um, and be able to pre-order, or would you rather wait until june when we can actually show you it in the flesh and you can come into the shop and buy it so any feedback on that would be much appreciated because we can do it whichever way you prefer uh next question when will the 3g pitch at the campus be ready for use that's from mark roberts uh the 3g pitch should be ready for use uh first of september uh probably well, at a push it could be ready for use in, in early august but we're, we're targeting the um the uh the new season for uh, sort of the, the local leagues and we're targeting the new, the new education year as well. So it will be ready for them. Next question, a big one. Is the stadium move still on the plan um, or has it been a parked project? Well, Paul McGonagall, I'm not blathered now. I can still read your, your comments. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was that? Stadium move. Has it been shelved or is it still... Able no, to not at it? all. Uh, it's still uh, on, on in terms of um, the major projects that we have. It's one probably one of the major projects that may well get us to the position whereby we can derive or generate um, uh, football performance agnostic income. So you know, it doesn't matter what happens on the pitch, basically, uh, and tries to get us towards that £8 million uh, absent structural change in the industry which will mean we are a, a, a sustainable championship club. Where that is, is we are talking to the council, we are talking to the owners of the land, uh, there is a site, and um, we, we, we just need to pull together what I call a feasibility study, which is to understand what difference that makes uh, to, to the club. Uh, and then, of course, you then move into the, realm, the, 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 the game of one, you have to finance it and how you do that it doesn't bother me particularly as FA was bust and we financed Wembley at 850 million. Uh, so we can do this here. 
The, the, the second element is, of course, involving the fans in the development of the stadium itself, because I think that's important. One of the things I don't want to do is to build a big mausoleum that we don't fill or we don't we lose some of the atmosphere. Uh, so I, I would think we'd start with around a 15,000 seats of stadium. Um, I'd like to ensure that we had, you know, the fans to consult with in terms of things like safe standing and so forth and so on. So there will be a massive period of consultation, but we're some way off that at this point in time. This is really now about understanding whether it can fly or not, because if it doesn't fly economically, then we won't do it. Right, we've got a question now on I follow from Dave Kesson. As a Rovers fan living 80 miles away on the other side of the Pennines, live streams on I follow have been an absolute dream. Is there any chance that these may be uh, allowed to remain in the future? And the simple answer to that is we don't know. Um, we are currently involved in a project that's exploring whether we can move on to a better streaming platform than that provided by the EFL. Um, I think I mentioned earlier I, having watched I Follow for the first time this season myself, I don't think it's a great product in terms of only having one camera from a fixed point of view and the way the adverts cut in, or really dull adverts, at sort of weird points where the commentators have no idea that they're coming in, so it sort of breaks up anything they're trying to say. We think we could probably do better than that in-house and we're exploring the opportunities, but we don't yet know what we're going to be permitted to do. Um, clearly, you're not usually allowed to broadcast in the UK. Um, you're not allowed to stream during the Saturday afternoon window. It's usually only in the off-peak games. Um, we don't know what the situation will be this year. Um, I think the I follow for us financially as a club. Um, a big contributor has been the fact that we've been getting some revenue from away games this year because of iFollow. Usually we wouldn't get anything from an away game, but uh, the way it works with iFollow is that the home team gets the first 500 away supporters subscription money for iFollow and the away team gets the rest. And because we've had brilliant support, we're, we've been averaging, I think, about 1,300 viewers. That's actually been a really significant um, income. And I personally don't feel, um, if, if we were allowed to continue that, I don't think it would actually change our away physical support, because I think those who travel the length of the country do it because it's an amazing atmosphere, and it's really quite a special thing to be part of the SWA when we're on the road. And I don't think they'll give that up, because I think that's what they're after. But I think it will enable people who wouldn't have travelled to follow the game so if we get any influence in it we will certainly push for that but we don't know at this stage and as soon as we do we will let you know um we also Close second there's an important one just coming from neil morgan neil uh, i appreciate your hair is thinning on top but light won't help you <laughs> got a question from nina hopwood about the women's team about um do we plan to give more exposure to the women's and girls teams? I think that is something that I would love to do. Um, one of the things that we're looking at at the moment is coming off the EFL template website, um, which would give us a great deal more flexibility in terms of other things that we can put on the website and give more prominence. Um, I personally find it quite difficult. You have to really look quite hard to find the league tables and, and results, etc., for the for the women's game. So hopefully, yes, that's something we can address. Um, we are rapidly running out of time one final question for you on um, the football related stuff which is about Jolly so somebody has asked a question uh, on screen of why did we sign a player who isn't ready for the first team um, you know I don't I don't talk about individual players um, you know, about Jolly in particular what we are trying to do is to um, change the the gap that exists between the academy and the first team and so I, I think it's very important it's one of the aspects of one of the programs i've got that i'm running personally that i actually want to see as um sign players who can develop into a first team player within the next two years it takes some of the risk out of developing players and there'll be lots more on that in in due course so um you know we we, we will look to trade players that's one of the aspects of the club strategically we want to do and to develop players and uh, it may be that we, we we do change the way we do that and we are moving towards that but more of that will come out over the course of the next six months 12 months 
Uh, a very quick question, are season ticket prices going up? Short answer to that is no. Um, they've been frozen, I'll probably get shot by Christine for revealing before the launch of the season tickets, but no, um, they have been frozen. Um, I think we need to wrap up because we are getting very close to our allotted hour. Um, a, a couple of plugs to get in. Um, you'll have seen tonight, we've put out, we've we're doing this as an experimental thing um, because of the massive success of the Brimstage beer that we did for Wembley. We're doing an end of season one where the players have signed the label that's been printed for that. Um, if that is a successful thing, if you guys like it, we'll try and make that an annual thing that we'll have a sort of commemorative brew at the end of each season that you can buy. Um, that will be going on sale in the shop tomorrow if it hasn't already gone on sale tonight. Um, I've been asked to remind people that season tickets are going on sale for renewal on the 4th after we come out of the um, social media blackout that is being done to try and highlight the problem that we have with um, discrimination and hate and racism in particular online at the moment. That's not us as a club, that's um, the world as a whole and football in particular. Um, if you are an existing season ticket holder, please do um, check that the you'll have an email that, that tells you how to log on with your TR number to check that all the details that have been moved on to the new platform are correct. Please do that before the 4th. Please don't, if you're an existing season ticket holder, register again for a new season ticket because that won't carry your existing seat details over and causes us um, grief on the back line. Um, and finally, um, we've been asked, um, as we've been on air, to do a shout out to Connor Jennings, um, just to say everybody at the club um, holds Connor in massively high regard and is wishing him all the very best in his fight against cancer, which I am sure he will rise to the challenge and deal with as he dealt with his illness prior to Wembley uh, when he came off the bench when he'd just come out of hospital and supplied the cross that scored the winner. So there you go. And equally when he played after the, 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 the unfortunate death of his grandfather. Yeah, Connor's a, Connor's a great lad and was, was a great, he was a credit to the club and uh, um, yeah, we wish him all the best. Uh, so I, I'm just going to finish now and say that I, I get back to where we started and, and I think that um, it is about perspective, it's about understanding that it's the next uh, 2,500 games, not necessarily the next three or five games that are important uh, to this club. Uh, that's what we'll continue to focus on until such time as we pass the baton on to somebody else, which whenever that is, who knows. Um, I'd just like to say once again, and just to reiterate, it's a thank you to the club, to the fans who have supported the club uh, throughout this period. And it has been a difficult period, but... You know, at the end of the day, you know, the fans are the club, owners come and go, managers come and go, players come and go, but the fans are the club, and we do recognise that. And I think the, the, that has been articulated and, and, and demonstrated uh, by the way in which the fans who've, who've supported um, everything that we've been doing through, when you look back, it's been you know, a pretty difficult 12 months. It's been a difficult 12 months for everybody, for the world, etc. But um, you know, um, within that, in our own little bubble as it were we i think we've you know everybody's um, contributed so thank you once again and uh, fingers crossed for saturday and the saturday after and we hope to see you all back at Frenton park for the pre-season as soon as we can thank you everybody thanks